Hi, I'm Bob Bosch. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to be speaking on how to make single line drawings with mathematical optimization. Uh, this is my 11th gathering um, at G4G6. I talked about TSP art. This is work that I did with uh, an Oberlin College student who's now a middle school math teacher, Adrian Herman. And then later after the conference, uh, Craig Kaplan contacted me and suggested numerous ways to improve that. So in TSP art, you start with some you know, recognizable image, and then you apply a stippling algorithm to lay down a bunch of points that collectively resemble that image. Then the next step is to think of these points as locations that a delivery driver must visit. They're based in one of the locations. They must visit each of the other ones once and only once and return back to where they started. They want to travel the shortest possible distance. So they're going to make a loop through all these points. And uh, this is an instance of the traveling salesperson problem, hence the name TSP Art. Uh, this shows part of an optimal tour uh, through these uh, 1,640 points. Uh, I obtained this with some really nice software written by Bill Cook and others at the University of Waterloo. Uh, but I didn't leave, I didn't draw every single line seg segment of the tour, hence the title, Connecting the Dots, the completion of the tour is left as an exercise for the viewer. Um, it's not that hard. Now, I post stuff like this on Twitter, at least I used to, and other people would repost it. And uh, about a year ago, I got a comment from a very helpful person on Twitter who said, well, isn't that the worst possible way to make uh, single line drawings? And I thought, whoa, OK. Um, but there's a point to it, uh, because the TSP is an NP-hard problem. It takes a lot of time to make these things. So is there maybe a better way in terms of amount of time required? So with a current Oberlin student, uh, I came up with this idea. Um, it might be an idea that someone else has explored, at least the first one. But the idea is to basically follow this line from the top left to the uh, bottom right. You're going through this uh, five, by five, array, 5 by 5 array of squares in kind of a zigzag fashion. That's one reason I call these zigzag mosaics. But also, each individual square tile is a zigzag, has a zigzag pattern. Um, so we can actually control how much zigging and zagging goes on in each individual tile and I'm making the center one a little bit more zigzaggy, and hence a little bit darker. And we could do that for each individual square. So here's one of these zigzag tiles. The zigzag path in black connects the midpoint of the left edge, point number one, to the midpoint of the right edge, point number five. It passes through that center of the square, point number three. The other two points are restricted to be on these vertical sliders. And the amount that each of those two points is off from the horizontal is controlled by a parameter s. So by changing s, we can make the zigzag path shorter or longer. If we let s be 0, it's a horizontal line. If s is 1 half, it becomes as ziggy zaggy as we allow it. Um, and with this, we can basically say, all right, we can use the Euclidean distance formula to compute the length of the zigzag path. And then we could say, hey, if we want our desired length of one of these zigzag paths to be some particular value lambda, well, we can just invert the function, you know, provided that lambda is bigger than or equal to 1. So it's really quick to find the optimal s parameter uh, to achieve a certain length that's desired, which might be based on a certain darkness value in the mosaic that you're trying to construct. So here's an example based on a 75 by 75 low resolution uh, rendition of a portion of Botticelli's Venus. I'm presenting it both sort of up close and from a distance. Here's one based on Leonardo's Mona Lisa. Here's one based on Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. Now, there's more. We can do double zigzag mosaics. So we can follow this from left to right, uh, going through the rows in serpentine fashion, and then we get to the bottom right of the bottom row, we can drop down to the bottom of the rightmost column and then proceed through the columns in a zigzag fashion and end near where we started. So I think these are things that you know, someone can look at with actually no description of what's going on, and they can convince themselves, hey, this is a single line. I can find my way through this from the starting point to the finish point. And again, we can control 
how much zigging zagging goes on in each individual tile. So we get these double zigzag mosaics. Uh, the horizontal zigzag path is controlled in the same way before with the parameter s. Uh, the vertical zigzag tile, you know, it's controlled through a different parameter t. We can compute the total length of those two zigzag paths. Now we have a function of two variables, l of s comma t. And if we want l of s comma t to be a desired total length lambda, well, we could solve for s and t. But there's going to be multiple solutions because we have a one equation and two unknowns. So instead, we could use gradient descent to minimize a loss function, f of st, which is uh, the square of the difference of the length and the desired length lambda. And it's kind of cool that if we start our steepest descent at different starting points, we get different images. So here's a double zigzag mosaic. Uh, again, Botticelli's Venus starting at a point 1 fourth, 1 fourth. If you keep s and t at the same value, that's going to persist. You can prove this quite easily by looking at the gradient. One thing I like about these is if you zoom in, you see things that look like tessellations, or actually more accurately, tessellations that morph into other ones. So I think of this as uh, parquet deformation. Uh, here's another one. Uh, in this one, we end up starting with s and t, again, uh, both at the same value, and that persists through the st uh, gradient descent algorithm. Here's one more. Now, we have to be a little bit careful with these. Anytime we're working with tiles that have fourfold symmetry, we want to avoid certain unfortunate symmetries. Um, some of these you could maybe hunt for and find. Um, if you start gradient descent in a different way, here the scheme is to let the starting values of s and t be 3 eighths and 1 eighths. If uh, i plus j, the sum of the row indices and column indices is even, and do 1 eighth, 3 eighths if the sum of the indices is odd, you end up with something that has less unfortunate fourfold symmetries in it. Um, and these two can be thought of as parquet deformations. Thank you very much.